Okay, uh, welcome everyone. So, um, my name is Nadia Al Ali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown University. And it's my great uh, pleasure to welcome you all to our um, first in person hybrid uh, lunchtime seminar after many, many years well, two years. Uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Mary Osprey. Mary is currently joining us as a visiting fellow uh, from Connecticut's College Global Islamic Studies. Marie's research focuses on modern and contemporary Iranian literature and its global circulation. Her current book project, The, Gl the Global Genres of Modern Iran, Flexible Forms and Cross-Cultural Exchange from Travelogues to Twitter, uses the interwoven modern histories of Persian and Euro-American literature to explore how transnational literary exchange under politically fraught circumstances is often mirrored in the crossing of genre boundaries. I actually feel a little bit um, frazzled because I don't know where the camera is for those who are joining <laughs> us. So I'm so, you know, I want to look at you, but I'm also thinking, okay, I want to look at the audience uh, who's joining us online. So. Um, you forgive me if uh, you know I'm not looking at you. <laughs> so the structure of today's event is uh, Marie will talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, unfortunately, those of you who are joining us online <laughs> will not be able to ask questions, but everyone in the room will be able to do so. So over to you, Marie. Thank you so much, Nadia, um, for that generous introduction and to the Center for Middle East Studies for welcoming me so early in the semester for this, what seems like a kind of grand reopening after two years. I'm really honored. Uh, and really special thank you to Barbara and to Emily for all their help setting up uh, the event today. <clears throat> so in this talk, I'm working from the premise of my book in progress uh, that despite Iran's geopolitical isolation from the West, there is a deep and wide network of connections between Persian and Euro-American literary cultures that has only grown richer through the 20th century 21st. And as a world literature scholar, my hope is that centering modern Iran in repeated acts of genre creation, rather than categorizing its literature as either a traditionalist or borrowed European forms, that that challenges claims about fixed centers and peripheries and other conceptions of world literature based on publishing economies and genre hegemonies. So across the arc of the book, I'm trying to position Iran as a source or a hub of not only classical, which may be better known to most uh, Western readers, but also modern world literature and culture through authors working in innovative genres and flexible forms. So here's an overview of the whole book. Uh, I focus on genre and form in examining how and why Iranian literature is and has always been a continuing global in its orientation and its ethos. Dis this is despite the Islamic Republic's self-imposed isolation, as well as the attempted demonization and ostracization of Iran by Western powers, perhaps especially the US, since the 1979 revolution, and in fact, long before that. I work through various genres in which Iranian writers have reached outward beyond Iran's borders, and in which Western writers have written about Iran, conversely, to examine how deep-rooted connections took shape, in particular forms and styles contrapuntally especially through the work of progressive, pacifist, and feminist writers. So first I look at travelogues by Furuk Varugzad from Italy and Vida Sackville West in Iran. Then I trace how the Ghazal form was modernized by Simini Bebahani inside Iran during the Iran-Iraq War and adapted into an anti-Vietnam War protest poem in similar ways by Adrian Rich in the US. In the third chapter, I study how Marjan Satrapi's transnational comics aesthetic of dissent in her graphic memoir, Persepolis, was shaped both by the French comic tradition of bande dessinée and the framing traditions of Persian miniature painting. And in currently writing the last chapter, which I'll be presenting some rough work from today um, in progress, I'm thinking about how since 2009, new forms and genres born on the internet are intersecting with poetry, uh, lyric poetry and how contemporary politics and both digital and surveillance technology inflect poetic form. So first today I'll say a little bit about the context of modern Iranian literature, then a little bit on literary genre and how the book positions modern Iranian literature within world literary networks. Then I'll present a little close reading from that le this last chapter in progress on what I'm calling the te techno-lyric 
as a new form that's facilitating cross-cultural literary exchange. So Iran and the United States, uh, of course, constantly constitute the headlines of each other's news. Um, and in recent years, Iran's isolation from the West has only grown, one might say, more entrenched with the JCPOA cancellation in 2018, um, current negotiations to revive it, of course, looking stagnant, uh, with Trump's travel ban and his maximum pressure sanctions campaign. Iran is almost always a player in geopolitical escalations in the region. But the rise of both far-right nationalism and interventionism in the global north coupled with the defensive stance of Iran's hardline regime, all these things affect culture and literature in almost entirely punitive ways. Sanctions, embargoes, curtailed or canceled visas for artists and writers, and so forth. Despite the impact of this political entrenchment and escalation on the creative arts, however, many genres and forms in literature, art, and film that have been sites of xenophobia or cultural purity discourse have, I think, through their expansion and adaptation, come to serve as kind of vehicles for cross-cultural um, understanding in a long-standing circuit between Persephone, Anglophone, and Francophone, and other traditions. In tracing the path of these formal vessels, I work from the critical premise of world literature, well established by Edward, everyone from Edward Said to Frederick Jameson, Homi Baba, and others, that genre, like all other cultural constructs, is inherently hybrid. So through this lens, I think a frequently overlooked long 20th century story of transnational genre creation unfolds within modern Iranian literature. As David Palombo Liu writes, form is the meeting place of a number of aesthetic and psychic investments, both the common ground and the vehicle for planetary thinking. World literature syllabi in North American and European curricula may include brief examples of Persian authors, typically from the classical period, working in classical forms, such as Ferdowsi, Hafez, or Rumi, but representations of modern and contemporary Iranian literature is often lacking. This is partly because, from the Pahlavi era to the Islamic Republic, Iran's modern geopolitics have made it more difficult and more urgent, I think, for literature to cross borders. In defying and expanding genre categorization, modern Iranian writers have resisted a global hegemony in which forms are too often seen to move only from a Euro-American center to a series of, quote, peripheral literary communities and markets. Um, so as Efrain Cristal writes here in response to Franco Moretti's kind of somewhat, I think, hegemonic map of, of centers and peripheries, um, he argues in favor of a view of world literature in which the West does not have a monopoly over the creation of forms that count, in which themes and forms can move in several directions. Debates surrounding the tension between modernization and westernization in Iranian literature have been ongoing for over a century. In many ways, nation has remained a rigid category in modern Iranian discourse, as in Jalal al-Ahmad and Ali Shariati's notion of qabzadegi, um, often translated as West toxification or occidentosis, uh, the term coined in 1962. On the other hand, the transnationalism of Iranian cultural identity has been evident also at all ends of the political spectrum. It and this ranges from the performative multiculturalism of Mohammad Reza Shah's revamped Persepolis at his heavily criticized 2,500 year celebration of the Persian Empire to the multifaceted uprisings against the Shah just a few years later, which eventually, of course, came to center on Khomeini's le leadership, but was originally sparked by a wide range of dissidents, uh, including constitutionalists, Marxists, feminists, atheists, and a range of Islamists. The most influential early 20th century Iranian writers, such as Nima Yushij and Sadeh Hedayat, who were early adapters of what many perceived as Western forms, respectively uh, for Nima, poems that dispensed with classical metrical versification, and for Hedayat, modernist novels, um, these writers were uninterested in Iranian nationalism. Many of them even permanently left Iran for Europe. Reinforcing the association of the European with the modern, um, Yushij, who's known popularly just as Nima, is often seen as the founder of, of Shereno, or new poetry movement. So there is this link between the modern and the European. But their work must also be understood in the cultural movement of Persianism. Uh, scholars like Kamran Talatov argue that the modernist brevity and newfound independence from classical forms associated with Arabic were sometimes seen as indications of insidious westernization and sometimes seen as empowering gestures that reclaimed a kind of national Persian heritage. So Iranian literary culture presents a unique point along the imaginative spectrum of Orientalism, you might say. Following the Islamic Revolution, its writers don't simply write back in a kind of post-colonial empire rights back sense after the ebb of Pahlavi era British and American interventionism. 
engaging in, um, to borrow Said's term, a rhetoric of blame. But instead, they continue, I think, a long-standing project of writing through and beyond post-colonial affect in a complex dialectic, not with not only English, but many other modern literatures, uh, and some of the most progressive and iconic literary Persephone intellectuals of the past hundred years have been deeply engaged with the work of writers in French, Russian, Turkish, and many other world languages through their mutual and synchronous experimentation with genre and form. Now I'll just say a bit about literary genre um, on a theoretical plane. So the question of what defines a literary genre or form, and by the way, I'm happy to talk more about the distinction between those terms, um, but generally, I. Uh, there is a lot of, in common parlance, crossover and overlap between how those two terms are used. Um, but generally, we think of genre as the what. Genre is referring, alluding more to content, and form as the how, more the structure and the tools. Um, so the question of what defines a literary genre or form, whether a genre is singular or multiple, whether it's fixed or dynamic, has been debated in literary criticism for several decades. Um, Jacques Derrida and the Law of Genre, back in 1980, explained how intrinsic this notion of sociocultural genre categorization is to the study of all literary texts. A text cannot belong to no genre, it cannot be without or less a genre. Every text participates in one or several genres, there is no genreless text. Genres, as Frederick Jameson points out in The Political Unconscious, can function as established social agreements that provide us with formulas for how to read a text within foreign cultural contexts. Quote, genres are essentially literary institutions or social contracts between a writer and a specific public whose function is to specify the proper use of a particular cultural artifact. So that's from the reader's point of view, but authors, of course, don't necessarily adhere to such social and critical norms of what a novel or a poem or a play should look like anywhere in the world as they're writing. But as Derrida goes on in that same essay, he draws an important distinction between passive and active categorization. He writes, there's always a genre and genres, yes, but such participation never amounts to belonging. Making genre its mark, a text demarcates itself. In other words, a text can actively situate itself within a genre, self-reflexively commenting on its own place within that genre and its tensions with other works in that category. And in so doing, I argue it can redefine the boundaries of the genre as a whole. So my view of the globalizing impact of open forms in modern Iranian literature proceeds from this early indication in Derrida that by playing in the spaces between genres, by hybridizing genres to create new and constantly evolving forms, texts create new literary and sociocultural places of exchange. Most contemporary genre studies scholars agree that genre is a concept without rigidly fixed definitions, but more importantly, shape-shifting formal containers can and do help authors, artists, and audiences who live in climates of xenophobia, demonization, and cross-cultural stereotyping simply talk to each other in ways that resonate in touch points across borders. But they also sensitively adapt to local specificities and historical particulars. So in this vein, I'm concluding my book, this last chapter, with a look at how literary genres, specifically lyric poetry, is being reshaped by digital technology. The physical and intellectual landscape of 21st century Iran has been slowly reshaped by the freedoms of expression afforded by the digital sphere flawed and vulnerable, as of course that sphere is, to surveillance and manipulation. <clears throat> and although the simplistic phrase, I'm sure we've all heard it, Twitter revolution, has now become overused to the point of banality to, to describe the events of 2009, um, widely viewed to have inspired 2011 uprisings across the Arab world, um, it's difficult to imagine how these massive green movement, they were called protests in Iran, following Ahmadinejad's heavily contested re-election, or really any Iranian protest since then, would have unfolded at such speed and magnitude without the on-the-ground documentation and the instantaneous speed made possible by the new genres and forms constantly being generated by social media, from tweets to TikToks. Because of the long and diverse waves of immigration and repatriation that have characterized post-revolutionary among artists and intellectuals, Iranian literary networks have developed not just in Iran and its diasporic communities, but they span the space between the two. New progressive media alliances, such as um, Zanon TV, generated during the Occupy movement, have used a mix of mediums in and out of Iran to provide an online space for, for example, feminist discourse, and have allowed alliances to form between activists organizing around different goals. Um, right now, we're seeing a boom, um, if you followed Twitter the last few days, or even week at this point, of the hashtag Iranian Lives Matter campaign uh, following the death of Masa Amini, um, who, was, who was beaten to death by the, the moral police. 
The 2022 picture here on the right is just from a few days ago, and I think it reminds us of the ways that digital, digital technology can sometimes render protest bloodless or forgettable or less effective. So the sign in the front here says, man, hashtag nistem, man ends on em. I'm looking at my Persian professor to <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not a hashtag, I'm a human, right? But ironically, these protesters are still gathering through social media, right? And the hashtag Iranian Lives Matter folds their protest into a larger intersectional network or even era of global protest against police brutality. Writer, writers, artists, and filmmakers have gravitated increasingly towards the use of mixed media and multiple timescales to suggest the intricacy of collaboration between a dissident group that can, I think, no longer be bifurcated into home and abroad categories. Online literary magazines and journals, as well as unofficial publications of poems on websites and social media feeds, have enabled a real globalization of the Iranian literary resistance movement, but also a kind of fractal diversification of its genres. So as genre creation has moved online in the last couple of decades, it has entered a more dynamic realm where no text, you could say, is ever really complete. From trending topics on Twitter to TikToks generating endless comments and memes and spoofs, the social media sphere of genre formation crosses the national and cultural borders so fast it's often hard to tell where they once existed. I propose that we might think about the new forms of art and literature emerging from these recent years of protest in Iran, increasingly embedded in digital storytelling methods, as a kind of culmination of the literary travels that took place throughout the 20th century by way of experimentation with intergenre. And one such intergenre on the rise is what I am terming the techno-lyric. So poetry, lyric poetry that engages, adopts, or deconstructs the technologies of authoritarianism and neocolonialism, and harnesses technology for its creation and distribution and or distribution in a central way. I argue that especially since 2009, new forms and genres born on the internet, tweets, Instagram posts, YouTube videos, TikToks, are increasingly intersecting with poetry. And contemporary international politics are increasingly inflecting poetic form. To conclude today, I'll present a little close reading by a well-known Iranian-American poet, Solma Sharif, to attempt to theorize what I call um, the techno-lyric. Uh, so this may be a little surprising because Sharif herself is not a, a frequent or public user of social media, um, but her use of technology throughout both of these collections I find really fascinating uh, on the formal level. And I'll just note quickly that even the cover image of Look, her first collection here on the left, uh, implies the role of technology in the inception of genre. Uh, this is Nisiphorniev's view from the window at Le Gras, widely known as the, um, the first photograph in history. Um, so I think it's so telling that this image that is only known by its remediation through modern technology and was only kind of legible and visible to us in retrospect as the first photograph in history um, is, the, is the cover image for this collection that has nominally nothing really to do with photography. Um, or this period, but it's the intersection of, like it's the role of technology, new technology in the creation of new genres that I think Sharif um, is, is implying in that choice. So her 2022 collection, Customs, uh, is, in the words of its press release, quote, engaged with both the border checkpoints where one proves or doesn't prove national belonging and the cultural customs of particular nations and communities. Etymologically, customs from the 12th century French or Latin costume or habitual practice is of course also tied to dress, appearance, performance, and even disguise. Uh, Look, again published in 2016, um, is a collection of lyric poems intertwined with or infiltrated by the language of modern neocolonial warfare and its technology. And I won't read this whole quote, but this is, a, um, this is her author's note at the end of that collection. Um, it kind of explains the premise of, um, of the book. And it's, it's this interlexical, or, or what I think you can call techno-lyrical premise, aims to show how deceptively neutral uh, military language is often used to cover over the violence of neocolonialism. So these terms from the Department of Defense's Dictionary of Military um, and Associated Terms are scattered throughout the poems in the book in small caps. Uh, and here she says a little more about um, kind of the normalization of that violent language. <clears throat> so I'll move on from that. Vulnerability Study, which is a poem from Look, is a very brief, fragmented, episodic meditation on precarity. The third and fourth stanzas here say so much about the bodily insecurity that characterizes life both as a Muslim immigrant in the US, um, Baba holding his pants up at the checkpoint, 
and in parts of the Middle East where war is woven into the fabric of everyday life and love and expressions of customs, also here you could say costumes, as intimate as weddings, um, often shot through with the specter of US military intervention, a newlywed securing her updo with grenade pins. So Sharif's poems and look, uh, six years ago now, we're already thinking about the surveillance that happens at modern borders and checkpoints as a kind of habitual technology in Im immigrant and diasporic life that repeatedly interrogates and controls one's identity based on national origin and international relations. The customary technology of the checkpoint effectively collapses your personal costume with the customs, traditions, habits, values that you're presupposed to carry with you and in some cases to disavow as a citizen of X country entering Y country monitored through biometrics, documentation, and surveillance every step of the way. The lyric form is a large and loose category, only contrasted with epic, broadly speaking, but universally, I think, characterized by three things. Its brevity, its roots in music and song, and its association with personal expression. So surveillance technology intrudes on at least two of these. Um, it intrudes on the beauty and the sociality of song. It intrudes on the notion of the poem as a private place, as a monologue um, given by the lyric speaker. But both in vulnerability study and in the second and the last poem, um, Sharif leans, that I'll show you today, Sharif leans into that interruption. And I think she draws on other aesthetics of fragmentation drawn from Iranian literary culture, such as, for example, the paradoxical isolation and connection of Ghazal couplets, even though this is not strictly a couplet poem, to reshape the techno lyric for a diasporic and multicultural audience. So I'll read this one aloud. It's called He Too. Returning to the US, he asks my occupation, teacher. What do you teach? Poetry. I hate poetry, the officer says. I only like writing where you can make an argument. Anything he asks, I must answer. This he likes, too. I don't tell him he will be in a poem where the argument will be anti-American. I place him here, puffy, pink, ringed in plexi, pleased with his own wit and spittle. Saving the argument, I am let in. I am let in until... The poem starts with a misplaced modifier that reveals inevitable power relations at the border. While the he of the poem, a US customs officer, is not the one returning to the country, Sharif's grammatical construction awkwardly inserts him as the de facto subject of the first stanza. Midway through the poem, the travel, as the traveler navigates the necessary social codes to be let through, the agency changes position from the he to the I, starting with I don't tell him. Withholding information is a necessary strategy for the diasporic or binational speaker to gain that agency. As is the alliteration that disempowers the customs officer by enveloping him within a, kind of a catalog of P's that make his whiteness and his pathetic, if not precarious, physicality seem puny, so puffy, pink. Um, enclosed in that ubiquitous pandemic barrier of plexi, right? Denied even the crispness of this potential rhyme with wit and um, the diminutive form of spittle. He does not get back the agency of letting her in at the end of the poem. While admission to the country hangs as a temporary, contingent, unpunctuated kind of cliffhanger at the end of the poem, it's the anon anonymous and systemic jaws of customs that are letting her into the country in, a pa in the passive tense, I am let in. As such, this is not a poem really about a conversation or even about an asymmetrical power relation between two people. The customs officer here is a figure for a potentially infinite number of others. He too will add a personal touch to the border's script of xenophobic interrogation and suspicion, in this case through his professed hatred of poetry. He is part of a larger fractal technology. The adver adverbial addition with the grammatically optional comma for emphasis, implies that the speaker has witnessed many such individual versions of the custom script before. So in this last chapter, I read Salma Sharif's work alongside Fatima Ehtisari, who's an Iranian poet exiled in Norway, and I posit that they're both part of a diasporic poetry community that is deeply shaped by technology, for better and for worse. If we assume a genealogical relation to a diasporic work's literary ancestors at home, quote unquote, or alienated from its ancestral origins completely, I think either of these per perpetuates what Edouard Glissant calls the violence of filiation. Instead, I find it helpful to foreground identities, affects, and strategies of relation in texts like these, which are combining and shape-shifting their formal containers, in this case, the lyric poem, but also the interrogation script, dialogue, some trace elements maybe of Ghazal, 
Um, a poetic, a poetic community and diaspora is recursive, but it's also progressive. Uh, it's kept vibrant by both returns and departures. Its techno lyrics are driven by devices such as addition, as we see here, and many other potential modes. A literary perspective based in relation identity, which is, again, which is Glissant's term, must take into account that Iranian liter literary culture is not confined within national borders. It wasn't left behind or scattered into isolated nodes during these massive migration waves around the revolution or before or after. Rather, no matter how precarious writers' lives may be, wherever they're physically situated in the world, Iranian literature is and, always was, uh, is and was always already global, as we can see, I think, in the transnational proliferation of the Ghazal from Arabic to Persian to German to English across centuries. We can see it in travelogues from the 17th to 19th centuries. We can see it in Iran's prominence in world cinema, especially the new wave and its descendants throughout the 20th and into the 21st centuries. And more recently, we can see it in hybrid genres like the graphic novel or memoir and what we might call, I think, the techno lyric. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so while I will give everyone a chance to reflect for, for a moment, um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so I guess I am uh, would like you to maybe convince me a bit more that it's really the same thing. I mean, for me, I feel like these are different things. The Iranian sort of making the argument that historically Iranian literature has always been global because of these historical connections with other um, bodies of literature. And to look at Iranian diaspora literature. Uh, and then, of course, there is a kind of, I guess they're the sort of the global, the transnational, and the diasporic. And to my mind, these are quite different things. I mean, at which point does you know someone who resides in France or in the US, at which point is this still Iranian or it's not American or French, right? I mean, that's also, I guess, those of us who are in migration and diaspora studies and who are trying to challenge the idea that there is a kind of authentic culture in those countries like the US or France, you know, so that, that's what I would be reacting against and I'd like you to reflect a little bit on. And the second um, question I have links to the role of translation. Mm -hmm. So I know a little bit about that in the context of Arab, Arabic literature and so this uh, friend of mine, Huda El Sada, who is a professor of comparative literature at Cairo University, she always makes the point, well, you know, the who gets translated and who gets left out. And um, I wonder, you know, when I think about Iranian culture and the way it's been transmitted to the West, certainly when it comes to art, there's this kind of obsession with Iranian women artists. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, is there something similar when it comes to writing and literature? is it more likely for an Iranian woman to be translated than a man, for example? I mean, I guess sort of a question of what role do, does translation play in making, creating something to become global? And secondly, is that gendered possibly? Mm -hmm. um, so in response to I think the, the first question you're asking me to just kind of tease out some of the differences between yeah. these terms and identify you know, where along the spectrum is something one thing or the yeah. other. Um, and I, I think I agree with your, with your <laughs> I completely agree with your implication that um, this is what I was trying, why I hark back to sort of the, I don't know, the original post-colonial theorist, even Said, and, and um, were literary scholars who insist that nothing is ever, there's no such thing as cultural purity, of course. And, Iranian culture, uh, neither Iranian culture nor any given literary genre was ever um, self-contained or complete, right? The things were always in flux. And that goes for um, these modernist writers that I briefly cited, that goes for the work of um, uh, of Sadeh Hedayat and, and Nima Yushij. And I was trying to sort of briefly, I know it's very quick, but briefly outline the, these fraught debates around were these modernizers, were these westernized, were they part of Persianism, right? Um, so there's no definitive answers, I think, to these questions. And as for the question of diaspora, um, 
Sharif's poems are an interesting example of this because she is writing more broadly about neocolonialism, in this collection anyway, in, um, well, really in both, but thinking specifically about look. Um, and some of the poems are deeply personal um, and um, characterized by a very um, Iranian diasporic phenomenon that um, I think is quite distinctive in Iranian diasporic literature, which um, Amy Malik calls subjunctive nostalgia, where it's I wish I could, I wish I had. It's a very second generation um, kind of nostalgia for something one didn't experience directly. Um, particular, I say, to the Iranian diaspora because there is, there's been less opportunity to, to go back. Um, but, um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, but the collect, so, yeah, so the collection overall is very, um, it's not binational. It's not about US-Iran relations. Some of the poems are about the particular, either Muslim American experience or Iranian American experience, and some of the poems are about the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan. It's a larger critique of US interventionism abroad, right? Um, if one can call a collection of poems a critique, which of course one can't. Um, and as for our translation and gender, this opens up a whole um, new set of questions, I think, which I address much more so in my third chapter. Um, briefly, uh, it's mostly about the graphic memoir, but I do frame it in terms of what many have called the memoir phenomenon, the sort of memoir boom by Iranian American women uh, that happened. I mean, really starting with Not Without My Daughter in yes. the 80s, but um, yes. the Sally Field movie, et cetera. Yes. Um, but maybe most famously in the early, around the time of the Iraq war with um, reading Lolita in Tehran, yes. right? Um, and Hamid Dabashi's mm -hmm. takedown of that book, calling as a Nafisi a native informant, identifying her connections to think tanks and so forth. Um, but, uh, my, actually my PhD mentor, Farzana Milani, calls, has called this in an essay the um, neo-hostage narrative, right? This tendency of many, many dozens and dozens of Iranian American women's memoirs published in this writing, this wave of, of Azhar Nafisi, um, in this kind of simplistic narrative of liberation, right? Finding liberation in the West, uh, following Iran as a countrywide prison and all of these kind of um, chador women of the morality police looking like crows and um, these really destructive, reductive um, it, um, types of imagery. But, um, but I think Persepolis, so to say a little bit about this third chapter, um, Persepolis partly because of its format, partly because it is a um, graphic narrative and not, um, it's, it's got that additional layer of mediation of, of text and Im image working together, that she's able to do two things, that she both um, resists the straightforward confessional of that neo-hostage narrative, and um, she's drawing on both literary and visual, um, I guess, ancestors from Iran, namely Persian miniature painting, right? The things she does with framing allow her um, to kind of speak more in that, speak in many registers at once, speak for and to um, a greater, a greater, a wider audience. Um, and it allows her to, you know, put in practice the, the French aesthetic, the Iranian aesthetic, um, and sort of walk the walk as it were, rather than um, treating the memoir as a necess necessarily a place of confession. Um, I don't know if that answers yeah. your question about translation, not really, but because these are mostly written in English originally, so I guess I can say um, I'm not really a translation studies scholar. Um, most of the work in the book is, um, <clears throat> is as you can see, you know, from Anglophone and, and Francophone texts, um, but I would be interested to know if, um, if, mm, if more women authors than by the numbers or than male authors from Iran at this point are, are, get, are getting translated. Yeah. Um, because I wonder if that answer would be different now than it was in 2003 even, yes. right? Anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now let's open it up for questions, comments. Yes, Filia. Yeah, you need to, oh, please, uh, if you could use the microphone. Thank you for this amazing talk and I'm really looking forward to reading your book. So um, I have two questions. One is that I see that in the chapter titles and I know that this was, the presentation was on the fourth chapter which is not completed yet. So um, my question is based on the titles basically. But I feel like um, you are focusing more on the relations with the 
relations of Iranian literature with the US, Britain, and such. And I'm curious if you're touching upon how you're not reproducing the genre hegemonies. your analysis and this kind of a relationship like with the Anglo-American world. And the second question is um, about the techno lyric. So one argument about the digital technologies is that um, they democratize um, social platforms and cultural productions. So I'm curious to know if techno lyrics are taken up by ordinary people and if yes, in, in what forms. Thank mm. you. Um, so, can, can, you, can you repeat the first question? I'm sorry, that um, am I reproducing genre hegemonies no, by? How, how do you touch upon, like in the book, I'm sure you're touching upon it. I'm just curious to know how are you touching upon the danger of reproducing the centrality of Europe, United States, Britain, in, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. in the genre Thank you. Um, these are both really <laughs> excellent um, productive questions that I'm thinking about a lot, so it's really useful to have this forum to think about the arc of the book as well as this recent, <clears throat> the recent work. Um, so structurally, I've really tried to, um, to center Iran, and maybe it's not so obvious just for the table of contents, by just the, the case studies, right? So um, Iran and Britain is chapter one, Iran and the US is chapter two, Iran and France, and then um, the last chapter I don't think really can be categorized in such an easy way. Um, but also I don't really address any quote unquote major Western forms, right? There's no chapter on the novel. Um, and by, by the time we get to the period of chapter four, I think we live in such a, a I don't know, scattered global literary environment now that maybe, I, my hope is at least that no forms can be pinpointed and then attached to, to a particular nation or, or culture or, or place. Um, for example, lyric poetry, right? But um, the Ghazal is of course not, for, to take one example, not Iranian either, right? It has this really complicated transnational history. So thinking back to Nadia's first question, right? Um, it's not really a book about how it's certainly not a book about how Iran, Iranians adopted Western forms, right? It's arguing against that notion. Um, nor is it a book about how Iranian forms were this uh, origin or source and then got adopted by countries or, or other cultures around the world, right? Um, when it comes down to each of these examples, each of these genres and forms were always already transnational or global, and now I'm being sloppy with the terms again, my apologies. Um, but the Ghazal has Arabic roots, right? It has um, Persian roots. Um, it, very early in its history fragmented um, and developed independently in all these different branches. Um, the graphic novel, I mean, if you are someone who reads you know, American superhero comics, as Satrapi did growing up, you might think of it as American form, but I think her version of it is using both um, the Franco-Belgian comic tradition from back to back to Tantan. I mean, she's cited as, has cited as a big inspiration, even though Tantan is, of course, deeply racist and orientalist. Um, but the Linclair style, and also, um, and also, as I said, Persian miniature painting and the way that she's playing with framing. I think she's deeply familiar with it, with that aesthetic. And in so doing, right, in kind of expanding the genre of the global graphic novel or graphic memoir, we should say to be accurate, um, she's, I think, challenging the notion that it's that it can be associated with any one culture or any one nation. Um, so I hope that speaks a little bit to your first question. And your second question is, remind me about social media and technology? So uh, you very rightly identified the kind of two pieces of the chapter that I feel like I still need to cobble together or you know, find um, how to hinge them together. But um, it is uh, well known, I think, that in 2009 and in subsequent protests, the po and protests way before that, back in the Islamic Revolution included, um, have included poetry as part of chants, as part of slogans. Um, chants often rhyme, of course, um, and it goes both in terms of protesters will uh, even cite lines from, uh, chant lines from Furuk Barakzad to um, using slogans uh, to rhyme or using slogans in a po poetic way, right? Um, uh, Roy Manko just, uh, the one, the line from, lines from the poster that I, the kind of rhythm of the lines from the poster that I read. And um, 
are they, are, as far as our average people using, or our everyday people on the street protesting using the techno lyric? I mean, I guess so implicitly, right? If, if we might think of slogans, we might think of social media generated slogans as little, um, I don't know, little mini stanzas or something, right? If we think of them in, in terms of poetics, then they're being generated and disseminated by technology, um, but also can't exist without their embodied versions. Um, I don't know if that answers it really, but <laughs> okay. Uh, but of course, um, what I presented today was a more conventional, you know, published form of poetry. So Fatima Tessari, who's the other poet I read closely in this chapter, um, may be a better example because she publishes a lot of her poetry originally on Instagram uh, and uses the image um, there and the caption really centrally in not only the content but the, the form of her work. Thank you for the questions. <laughs> Thank you. Michelle, yes. All right, testing. Um, <laughs> thank you so much um, for this talk. I have a lot of questions and so many things that I want to discuss with you right now, but um, I'll start with a, sort of my basic question, which I think is not too dissimilar from Nadia's question, but we'll see. Um, I'm basically wondering how you distinguish, like how carefully you're distinguishing between sources that you consider sort of exile-based writers or you know sources that come through France, like Persepolis coming through French, versus those sources that are, you know, coming translated out of Persian. Um, I just think it's a very sensitive question, especially for people who are interested in the things that are actually being translated out of Persian. Um, because even for, even for us, like, who are uh, well aware of what's being translated, it's, all, it's often coming through French, like Disoriental mm -hmm. was so popular coming from French. Mm -hmm. The Enlightenment of the Green Gage Tree, which was mm -hmm. for the Booker, at least it was written in Persian, thank goodness, but, um, you know, it's an Australian-based writer that's not actually famous inside of Iran. So I guess what I'm saying is, like, there's this tension between sort of what gets famous outside of mm -hmm. Iran and what is actually famous inside of Iran and we tend to feel like the inside of Iran things are are kind of neglected but you know you have Behbahani here you have Farooq um, Farooq so I was just wondering like how you situate those and how you try to make that distinction clear in your in your work yeah it's clearly something I need to uh, you're making me think I need to more carefully <laughs> distinguish between them because um, I think the internet is a big player here, right? And um, you know, I'm sure much better than I do, how um, I think it's a, sort of a question of the individual author's um, tolerance for pirate copy work and stuff that gets mm. published online and translated, um, which of course happens, it's probably it's one probably one of the biggest kind yeah. of translation black markets of, of the world, right? Um, Absolutely, yeah. And um, I'm thinking of, for example, there was this little I guess meme of Persepolis called Persepolis 2.0 that appeared. Did you remember seeing this? Oh, I didn't um, see it. Uh, so it was sort of recasting, very much copying Satrapi's style, like total plagiarism. Oh, okay. But it appeared, I think. Um, I hope I don't have this wrong, in Persian first and then was translated to English, but appeared as a webcomic inside Iran first. So there are no easy answers to mm -hmm. you know, what, what starts where. And you're right that at some point in the book it does shift, and I guess it's about halfway through. Um, you know, I think Satra P, to, take, to continue with her as an example, is someone who really welcomes um, riffs like that, memes like that. Um, mm -hmm. And welcomes all kinds of you know, welcomes the translated of translation of her book, which, by the way, has been banned not only in Iran but, of course, like in Chicago public schools, banned for um, yeah. lots of less, you know, lots of bans all over the world of, of her book and her film as well. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the question of popularity raises also is another really interesting one, right? I don't know, and I should find out how well known. Uh, or popular, so Ma Sharif's work, for example, is, is in mm -hmm. Iran. I don't know. I don't know if not, she's been not. not I would yeah. say not <laughs> <Yeah>. known. <laughs> if anyone's translating her to, per, to Persian, um, I, I imagine they're translated because there are lots sure. of literary interests. But it's not. I wouldn't say like generally. Yeah. Yeah. No. I uh, more originally this project was much more fo focused on kind of cultural production and um, 
circulation and popularity, and I kind of moved away from that, but it might be time to, to revisit mm -hmm. it a little bit. Um, uh, I had one more thought, but it escaped. Um, oh, Kaveh Akbar, I know, has worked with mm -hmm. a, an Iranian translator he met on Twitter um, to produce, and I don't know exactly where, uh, maybe oh, you know. Oh, nice. Yeah, um, who wrote published. like 99 names, uh, the 99 names of exile, or Kaveh Akbar? Kaveh Akbar, yeah, no, yeah. I, he worked with her, um, to produce a Persian translation of, I think, I thought it was his first book, Calling oh, the okay. Wolf, or oh, okay. maybe not. I mean, there's more projects, I guess, yeah. they worked on together. He also left Twitter for a while. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm less interested in, like, backwards translating from the West to Iran and more, like, from Iran <laughs> to... I, the right, fact that yeah. we haven't even, like, mentioned censorship in, in modern Iran is indicative of how little we're, like, dealing with contemporary Persian text and sphere, right? Because Say that again, how little we've mentioned censorship mm -hmm. and its influence over contemporary Persian literature mm -hmm. is indicative that we're not actually dealing with Iranian texts, which is fine. I just feel like the modern Iran is actually misleading in your title, right? Because, like, the, the point of it, the whole point is that it's not just about modern Iran, it's like this whole cross cultural, intercultural thing. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, tying it back to modern Iran and, like, even talking about, you know, 2009 and all this stuff, mm -hmm. like, this is not. Sorry, I'm being quite blunt. This is not necessarily like what we think of, of as the literary representations of those things. Like, there's lots of rap um, poetry going on. Um, there's like Shah Jarian using Hafez and classical poetry and like redeploying it mm -hmm. to mean different things in political context. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'm just saying like, where is modern Iran in the thing? No, not not a small, not a big question at all. Don't worry about mm -hmm. it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I do talk about censorship quite a bit with Bebahani, okay. for example. Um, and uh, in in a previous article, I, um, I wrote about Mandani Poor's censoring an Iranian love story, which of mm. course is all about. I mean, it's a, again a very removed. Um, mm -hmm. But he was here, right? I don't know. Yeah, if, uh, yeah fantastic. Um, yeah, several years ago now. But um, isn't this? I think he wrote. Did he write the novel while he was here? Oh, I'm not sure when when he wrote it. I think it was pretty shortly after. Um, you know. Uh, Moving, moving into exile, uh -huh. but um, if you're if you're wondering t uh, more about translation from from Persian and the politics of that, so before um, sorry earlier when you were mm -hmm. speaking a few minutes ago, you said can you repeat? Oh that? yeah, I'm just saying like it in terms of modern Iran actually being at the center. Mm -hmm. It's just. I mean, obviously a book is a long thing and you just talked for 30 minutes, so there's many things you had to leave out. I'm just wondering like, how you address this sort of gap in terms of not necessarily addressing Persian language contemporary, because these are all, you know, Behbahani from the 80s, Farouk from 60s, mm -hmm. like 50s. In terms of contemporary stuff, like, it seems to be mm -hmm. kind of a, a gap or something you would expect based on the title. It's, it's not being dealt with. Yeah, um, I think the third chapter is a is a separate thing. But I um, really want to talk more with you about yeah, the last sorry, chapter I just because I agree. <laughs> what I'm seeing, hearing, you know, emerging yeah. this really, really helpful comments is there's kind of a gap right between the political context of 2009 and then yeah. the diasporic, the two diasporic writers that I examined. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sorry, I mean, yeah. fled much more recently. Um, but in between them, someone like uh, Sharjahan. I mean, it would be interesting to to kind of bridge that gap more in terms of building a translation continuum and also a, um, yeah, I guess a diaspora continuum. Sure. Yeah. I mean, okay. You sorry. I, I, um, <laughs> you definitely need to have <laughs> lunch to talk. and talk. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm conscious of time. And so I was um, wondering if there's one more question. One. No. Yes, Alex. I'll ask a question. Um, so I was curious, I mean, I guess this um, kind of gets back to, I mean, I, was, I couldn't help but think of, you know, the, po the last poem that you shared with us, and then you were talking about this sort of kind of neo-hostage narrative and like the nation as prison, but also thinking about how technology kind of diffuses the prison, you know, in a kind of like Foucauldian way or whatever, you know, that, that kind of the surveillance, mm -hmm. the digi digital surveillance, Kind of surrounds us. The, you know, it's not just at the customs. You know, uh, going through customs, right? That people are worried that that they're going to, 
you know, face some kinds of consequences for, um, you know, their, their thought, their, their um, kind of resistance to the established order. Um, so I guess, you know, that this is not really kind of a clearly formulated question, but I guess kind of how the techno lyric, lyric kind of um, works as potentially a kind of like global poetic response to globalizing surveillance regimes. Like, is this a kind of, of a form or a genre that we're kind of, you know, we're seeing as a kind of emergent genre globally? I mean, I can imagine, you know, other writers from elsewhere, right, kind of facing similar kinds of issues and, and engaging in similar kinds of poetics, right? Um, so I was just curious if that's something that you've kind of seen, like, outside of this, you know, the cases that you've shared with us today as a kind of, a kind of emergent global genre. In, in other contexts? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have to think. So something that's maybe not exactly about surveillance technology, it's more about technology as of mass incarceration. Um, something I look briefly at, or may look briefly at in this last chapter, I'm not sure, um, is um, Reginald Dwayne Betz's Ghazals in Felon, or maybe I'll look at it in the second chapter, I'm not sure, uh, where he uses redaction really heavily as a kind of technology. Um, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with the book to, um, to, to block out huge swaths of, to just kind of mimic the, the prison experience. But it also harks back to the, the form, right? The form of the ghazal, which is self-contained. Al-Rasha Ali, of course, his ghazals um, sort of mimic that, um, the idea of enclosure, but also linking, um, also connection, right? That's so intrinsic to that form. Um, and for Betts, that, that is translated to uh, a contemporary American context of mass incarceration. Um, so. Yeah, that's maybe surprising, um, but surely there are many, many others that in the Latin American context, for example, that I'm just out of, out of feel for me. But yeah, um, we are just about to finish, but I just have some an idea. I mean, what sort of linking back to my first question, mm -hmm. um, which is I, I've always found interesting when doing research on diasporic communities, and I've done that mainly in the context of. Iraqis, but also Kurds, and mm. in the past Bosnians, how um, their discourses and um, their practices are quite different depending on where they live. Okay, so um, I mean, Iraqis in Germany, in Berlin, uh, have slightly different themes in their sort of cultural productions than Iraqis, let's say, who live in. Detroit, right? So I'm, I guess that's, you know, sort of going back to my earlier question, you know, what, when you say Iranian, and also that links back to Michelle's, you know, how much is Iranian and how much is actually imbued or influenced by the specific national culture, and that of course is never homogenous either, or, you know, the kind of the specific assemblage that you find in a specific empirical context. Mm. So, you know, France as opposed to the US, as opposed to Germany, you know, what, I, I'm wondering whether that's something you could, you would reflect on. Do you think that's, rel I mean, relevant in your work? Whether, sorry. Whether it matters where mm. someone writes from. Mm. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yes. yes. Short yes. answer to that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, uh, I mean, the specific, that's, um, this is what I meant when I said uh, that the this process of genre adaptation, I think, does specific like it, it works against flattening historical particulars. Right? Again, it works against flattening, um, erasing local specificities. The more global something is, does not mean it's less local, right? Um, if that yeah. makes any sense. So, um, Satrapi is another example of this. Yeah. Right? The, her work is, is so French, right? It could yes. not ever have produced <laughs> anywhere else but Paris. Exactly. But, yes. And the her. Um, the American book covers are very different than the yes. one quick yes. anecdote, yeah. right? The, the American book covers are very sort of neo-orientalist yes. and she's yes. framed in, in her Tudor and then in yes. acrylic cues. But the French book covers are just her on horseback. And yeah. There's one that's kind of a Napoleonic horse mm -hmm. and there's one that's, um, the rest are kind of evocative of Chaname, the warriors. Yeah. But yeah. anyway. 
very much. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, all of you, for attending and participating. Yeah.